Hey everyone, I'm Jerry Saffer and this is Kitco News. Be sure to click that subscribe button. Well, it's been a whirlwind of a week for the economy with data flying in from all directions. We've seen the U.S. Consumer Sentiment Index rise for the first time in five months. But hold on, housing starts took a nosedive, dropping 6.8% in July. So what does this conflicting data really mean? I mean, are we seeing the first signs of a stable recovery? Are we on the edge of an economic slowdown? And with Jackson Hole just around the corner, will the Fed set the stage for a major rate cut, or is the data a little too murky for a cl clear path forward? Of course, to help us navigate through all of this, I'm joined by a powerhouse in macroeconomic strategy, having previously led one of Wall Street's leading sell-side research firms. Let's welcome Darius Dale, who's now the founder and CEO of 42 Macro. Hey, Darius, welcome to Kitco. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the very uh, kind introduction. Looking forward to this. Yeah, I mean, it's been a crazy week. We talked about it in the intro there. Certainly an interesting week uh, for data. We've seen the U.S. Consumer Sentiment Index rise for the first time in five months. Yet we just talked about this. Housing starts has plunged 6.8% in July. How do you reconcile these conflicting signals, Darius? I mean, you, you really get into this data. Break it down for us. Yeah, 100%, man. And that's, that's cut part of my job as a macro risk manager. You know, with clients all around the world sort of looking at us. For guidance for these types of things and i think it's really important to understand where you are in the business cycle when you're you know interpreting uh you know sort of uh, high frequency economic data so we'll start with uh the, you know the housing starts and building permits data that we got as well as the nahb uh, home bidder market sentiment uh, report that we got yesterday uh, those data points are indicative of a uh, more accelerated decline in the housing market uh, if you look at housing starts and building permits uh, simultaneously, uh, they're back, back to the level, low levels that we haven't seen since about uh, the summer of 2020. So that's obviously not good because the housing cycle has historically been a persistent leading indicator of the broader business cycle. Uh, it leads on the way down and it leads on the way up. So obviously, it's likely that we see growth slow uh, in the months ahead. Now, uh, when people hear those things, they start to think, oh, I should get nervous and I want to put on, uh, you know, sort of uh, I want to take down risk in my portfolio or, or short things uh, in the equity and credit markets. And uh, we would say that's not something we would do or advise clients to do here today, because, again, we do not believe that there is a high probability of a developing recession in the U.S. economy when you look at the other uh, elements of the business cycle. And so, uh, Jeremy, we the retail sales data point and the industrial production data point, I want to say on Wednesday, and those are also persistent leading indicators of the business cycle. And neither of those data points are confirming that we're having an accelerated slowdown. We're just having a meandering off the top of the growth sign curve, and that's probably going to persist over the next year or so. Right, of course. And there's so much narrative. I mean, we look at the S&P today, and I think it's the best week of the year. So to your point, if you maintain a long position, you could have done well here. And I mean, I hate to be a doom and gloomer, but, you know, is the government data painting an accurate picture of economic health? Or are we missing some of these underlying weaknesses? Like you said, in housing, is this something that's going to just show up ahead? No, no, I think the government data is doing a great job of, of telling us exactly where we are in the U.S. economy, which has been in a ubiquitous growth cycle upturn since going back to the summer of 2022 when we authored our resilient U.S. economy thing. Uh, we're sort of getting towards the end of that uh, in terms of the resiliency that we've observed in the economy. We're seeing evidence of a softening labor market that is perhaps softening at a faster rate than we, had, uh, than we have been experiencing in recent quarters. But by and large, when you look at the preponderance of evidence, you know, across things like jobless claims, temporary employment, cyclical employment, the layoffs and discharges rates, et cetera, you know, productivity, uh, corporate profit growth, those types of cycles, which are lead leading indicators of the broader business cycle. It does not suggest that we are headed for a severe downturn that would cause, you know, trending market risk. And so, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of landing the plane on this discussion with respect to growth, it's very likely that growth slows over the medium term. However, it is unlikely that growth in the U.S. economy specifically uh, slows as fast as the consensus is currently expecting it to slow. And as a function of that, we're probably not going to see the kind of rate cuts priced into the four rate curve here uh, in the U.S. Uh, th th as much as they're currently priced in. And so there's going to be a reconciliation uh, in the quarters ahead. But for now, we do believe that the, the outlook for risk is, is relatively sanguine on a three to six month forward time horizon. Three to six months. That's good to hear. I mean, there's a lot of people that are curious about it because, as you said, we saw the University of Michigan today come out with this consumer uh, sentiment index. And of course, that rose to 67.8. But inflation expectations are still above that target that the Fed set at 2%. I think they're at 2.9. Durable goods purchases have dropped to their lowest level since 2022. 
I guess my question is, Darius, because you're a macro expert, when you start looking at all this narrative, including ourselves, when we start pumping out this news, is this so-called optimism and sentiment really just a temporary, you know, illusion, or is it more political narratives? We start to open it up and it almost becomes more political at this point. Yeah, well, we're seeing a pretty big bifurcation, uh, both on the yeah. political side of the aisle. Uh, with respect to the consumer sentiment data, but we're also seeing a pretty significant bifurcation with respect to uh, income levels. Uh, well, that's something that's been a persistent feature of this business cycle, which are lower to medium income uh, households have generally underperformed upper income households from the perspective of consumer sentiment and obviously with from the perspective of consumer spending. Uh, when it comes to forecasting the direction of the U.S. economy, what you need to get right are the activities and, and, and behaviors of the rich cohort, uh, because that's what drives the bulk of consumer spending, which drives the bulk of U.S. Uh, economic uh, output. And so if you think about uh, consumer spending specifically, the lower third of households from an income cohort standpoint only account for a combined 15 percent of consumer spending here in the U.S., whereas the upper third uh, uh, cohort of households from an uh, income standpoint account for 51 percent of consumer spending. So you have to understand that the rich folks in this economy have an outside share in terms of producing economic outcomes and with financial conditions continuing to be very easy uh, and obviously the growth cycle itself being quite uh, robust as well as the profit cycle continues to be in an accelerating upturn. Uh, it's very unlikely that we fall off a cliff from an economic standpoint because the rich people are still doing quite well. Yeah, the rich people are doing well, but it's something I hear. You know you're you're doing the interview well when you get hate from both sides of the aisle. And the fact of the matter is, is even as things are doing well in the economy, people are struggling, people are suffering, and we're starting to see it in some of the spending behavior. So talk to me about that. I mean, what's the divide here between Main Street and Wall Street? Yeah, the big divide is is on the direction of the, of the U.S. economy from the perspective of the composition of consumer spending. So recall right. that COVID, when we first came out of COVID in 2020, 2021, we had a significant portion of consumption that was over indexed uh, at the time to goods consumption. And over the past year or so, we've seen services consumption really accelerate uh, while goods consumption is that pulled back. Uh, now we're at sort of middling levels in, in terms of the growth rate uh, for services consumption here, whereas goods consumption continues to be you know, well below trend. Uh, if we can continue to sustain you know, the, the positive economic sentiment and positive uh, financial conditions, then it's very likely that services, cons services consumption, the growth rate of that, can remain at this sort of trend type level uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, and that's obviously being drilled, fueled by uh, the activities and, and, and demand uh, amongst the, uh, the upper income cohort that we're talking about here. So this is, again, a U.S. economy that is going to moderate from a growth standpoint. Uh, we're, you know, the labor market, which has been a uh, key factor in this income driven business cycle, which is very important, by the way, Jeremy. I think a lot of investors have been erroneously focused on the policy rate as the sort of leading indicator for the business cycle. And in this particular cycle, uh, that was unlikely to be the case, uh, given that um, this is an income driven business cycle. And so obviously we need to watch income uh, as the primary driver of activity as opposed to credit growth and then the contraction or expansion of, of, the, of the credit markets. And the reality is both of those things are actually still quite quite rosy and, and robust. Uh, they're not as robust as they were at the peak of growth, uh, you know, dating back a couple of quarters, and they're going right. to get worse, but they're going to get worse at a pace that should threaten uh, market, uh, you know, the broader stock market or the credit markets uh, anytime soon. Interesting. I mean, when we see a little bit of the slowdown, do you think it's going to start to hit the pocketbooks of not consumers, but the businesses? I mean, are we going to start seeing these next quarter numbers coming in a little bit more weak? I mean, we saw this pullback in the S&P and in the market itself, but, you know, there's there's curiosity out there if we're over, you know, evaluated or is this where's it going to go? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so with respect to the corporate profit cycle itself, as I mentioned, we remained in an accelerating upturn. Uh, the leading indicators of that cycle were suggestive that it should continue. However, if you think about this from the perspective of we're in this sort of productivity, I wouldn't say productivity boom, boom is probably too strong of a word, but we are certainly having an above trend productivity dynamic in the U.S. economy that has contributed to margin expansion uh, and the fact that corporations have been able to continue to accelerate uh, profit growth. That, in our opinion, is hard to forecast. And, and, and more importantly, we are so far above trend with respect to productivity growth, the baseline assumption for amongst market participants should be that it's probably going to, at the bare minimum, moderate uh, in the quarters ahead, which will start to put more pressure on corporate margins. And more importantly, when you get into the first half of 2025, at least according to our estimates, we believe that we're going to hit the bottom of the sine curve in inflation and start to cycle higher again uh, throughout 2025. 
And if that's the case, you're talking about growth slowing to a potentially below trend pace in the first half of 2025. You're talking about inflation bottoming at a level that is inconsistent with the Fed's 2% target and starting to accelerate from there. And perhaps what's happening alongside that is that you're having a moderation or perhaps a significant slowdown in productivity growth. Those three things, if you put them together, you're talking about a margin squeeze and a, and a significant slowdown in earnings. So in our opinion, where we have where we see the most market risk uh, from a time horizon perspective is in the first half of next year, as market participants have to reset their expectations about 2025 earnings expectations and, and, and so on and so forth. But again, right now, we don't know if the markets really need to debate that because historically, we have not seen markets be that forward looking. They're typically only about a a month or uh, w one to three months uh, looking ahead in terms of what the markets care about. Yeah. You know, has anything surprised you here, Darius? I mean, you know, gold's rallied to 2,500 on the spot side. And then I know it had a subsequent pullback. And then we get the weakening U.S. dollar. It seems to reflect a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, you know, I know that you talk about gold, Bitcoin. Give me a little market update. Where, where, where are you in this hedge against the growing risks here? Yeah, no, that's great. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, we're cautiously optimistic. And no, and, and I know that doesn't sound like much from the perspective. When most of them say that, it doesn't really mean much. However, yeah. in the context of our systematic uh, macro risk management process, it actually does mean something. So what we've been advising clients to do in their portfolios uh, since the end of June, we were ubiqu we were ragingly bullish uh, from the beginning of November to the uh, end of June. And at the end of June, we told clients to start taking out risk uh, and, and, and equities and credit. Uh, and start to increase their risk in early June, rather, uh, in, in the fixed income markets, uh, specifically in the Treasury market. And so obviously those are decent pivots. And we are continuing to advise them to maintain this, what we are calling a hybrid Goldilocks with deflation characteristics market regime. Now, what does that mean, right? Goldilocks and deflation sound like they're opposing forces. And generally speaking, in market regime terms, they are, right? Deflation is a typical risk off regime. Uh, Goldilocks is a risk on regime. And so how we're advising clients to merge those two regimes is, position for Goldilocks in asset allocation terms, in terms of how many stocks versus how many bonds you have in your portfolio, but position for deflation in factor leadership terms, in portfolio construction terms. So what type of stocks and what type of uh, fixed income instruments uh, you're long should be oriented towards deflation, which are defensive type names like consumer staples, uh, utilities, uh, healthcare, uh, te mega cap growth, and specifically the technology sector. Uh, those are the types of equity type exposures you're gonna have. And within the fixed income markets, you're gonna be high grading your fixed income portfolio uh, to the treasury market, to the investment grade credit, to mortgage backed securities, and out of the things that I previously led in the fixed income market, which are like high yield credit, uh, leverage loans, et cetera. We think uh, the markets are very much debating that transition and 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 we think the the beginning unwind of the yen carry trade was kind of the uh shiver shot across the bow uh in that in that and so uh that's obviously rewarded our clients for making that pivot and we expect that that kind of type of defensive leadership amid positive performance in asset markets we expect that trend to continue Hmm. So you're you're defensive in a little bit of a position, but I mean, it's almost seems like since COVID that portfolio allocations have completely went out of the window and everyone's kind of doing a different strategy at this point. You know, there seems to be this rise in consumer sentiment. Talk to me a little bit about some picks, if you could. Uh, you mean uh, stock picks? On the equity side. Yeah. I'm just curious. What are you watching over the next three to six months? Yeah. I mean, over the next week, I mean, so we do the same thing every day, six days a week at 42 Macro, we're incredibly systematic uh, in terms of how we uh, help clients stay on the right side of market risk uh, through the lens of our fundamental research process. It's very Bayesian, it's very Bayesian it's reference process in terms of absorbing all the data and analyzing all the data in the context of how it should you know, flow through the business cycle. Uh, we understand exactly how the business cycle works here and, and mm. what to look for and when to look for it. Uh, and so with respect to what we're watching, we wanna see a few things. One, are, is, our, is growth slowing as fast as we expect? Or is it slowing as fast as consensus expects? If it's slowing as fast as consensus expects, then we could have a little bit more market risk uh, develop, which means deflation will eventually win out in terms of this uh, this current uh, you know sort of a back and forth battle between go to loss and deflation in asset markets. Uh, if it growth slows as fast as we, or slows as slowly as we expect, then it's very right. likely that asset markets can resolve this debate in a Goldilocks type fashion, because again, you will have persistently positive economic surprises there uh, throughout. Uh, and then the second thing we're obviously watching is on the inflation front. Uh, we expect inflation to continue slowing. Uh, we were right as rain in terms of expecting, uh, you going back to Q1, when we had the inflation uh, uh, backup uh, and there was a concern about inflation, uh, we made a call uh, towards the end of Q1 and the early part of Q2 that inflation would actually start to surprise to the downside uh, throughout the second quarter and into the third quarter. And that's obviously what we're seeing on the tape, uh, most as evidenced by the most recent PPI and CPI data points. We think we're getting closer to the end of that process 
And by the time we get into the fourth quarter, maybe the case that inflation is starting to be under higher again, at least according to our models. And then and so we were looking for to see confirmation of that. Uh, and so that confirmation of that would obviously cause uh, investors to start to price out some very aggressive rate cuts from the four rate curve. If you look at December 2024, Fed funds futures, they're pricing in about three rate cuts relative to the Fed. Most recent dot plot of 25 basis points. That's going to change. Obviously, we're going to the new dot plot uh, in September. Uh, so perhaps the, the, the be resolved. But 2025 is where we see the most risk from the perspective of the bond market, from the perspective of uh, money markets pricing in terms of the money markets are currently expecting about a basically a full full percentage point more of rate cuts than what the Fed is currently projecting uh, by the end of 2025. We think that's wrong. Uh, we think the markets are going to be proven wrong on that. But again, I don't think that's a risk that markets are going to have to uh, deal with or contend with until the first half of next year. Yeah, and I mean, certainly the risks that the markets have had to contend with have been mixed, to say the least. And then we have Jackson Hole just a week away, and we got these economic signals at play, of course. We're not quite sure what's going on. Do you expect the Fed to set a clear rate a a cut agenda, or is the data a little bit too murky here uh, to you know shift in some policy shift? Yeah, I think the Fed is going to set a clear rate cutting agenda from the perspective of we're ready to go. We're probably going to go in September. It's very likely that they use the Jackson Hole platform to appease the markets and, and guide to uh, the beginning of their policy normalization cycle. However, it's very unlikely that they commit to a sequence of, of rate cuts uh, as if they were in a uh, real true easing cycle, because again, we don't think the economic statistics uh, warrant uh, that that dynamic. I mean, even Claudia Sam herself, when the Sam move was triggered in the July jobs report a couple of weeks ago, came out and said, hey, look, <laughs> don't look at me. I don't think this is I don't think this is the, the, the real deal. And uh, we were right alongside her in, in, in cautioning investors not to overreact. Uh, to that uh, one data point, because the broader preponderance of evidence continues to signal that, you know, we have a relatively resilient economy. Uh, It's slowing. It's likely to continue slowing. Uh, But ultimately, if we're correct in in terms of the pace of slowdown and where we're likely headed in terms of the the, the depth of the slowdown, it's very unlikely that we're going to see the kind of rate cutting cycle uh, that's currently priced into the market. Again, it takes some time for markets to recognize that. You know, we kind of I think we, two things. I think we need to get out of, you know, uh, the summer. There's always a lot of volatility in the summer, uh, particularly heading into mutual fund year end in September. So, again, that that may be something that causes a little bit more volatility from a seasonality standpoint. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of the day, as we're having this conversation, Jeremy, you and I in Q4 and Q1 of next year, it's very likely that the markets will have bottomed at some point this summer and rally through the year end. Because, again, the, the economic uh, the economic forces, the macro forces uh, should really currently warrant that. Yeah, not to mention the election, too. So are you just buying the dip here, Darius? You do, taking a look, seeing where the short, or the haircuts are, where the discounts are, and you're, you're trying to you know, buy that position, hold out for this three to six month run up, and then you're thinking Q1, Q2 next year, a little bit of a shakeout. Yeah, that's that's kind of our that's uh, that's our general disposition for towards markets right now. So again, we think investors in the in the equity markets you want to be defensively positioned. You know, those are things like mega cap growth, quality, uh, dividend compounders. Those are the types of factors uh, you want to look for uh, in your equity uh, allocations, and obviously high rating in uh, your portfolio and fixed income terms, as we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, again, we we do think there's a reasonable degree, a uh, reasonable chance that asset market the beta of overall asset markets remains positive over the medium term because again. There's just no real bear case right now. I mean, you'd have to say that either liquidity is going to contract in a significant manner. uh, You either have to say growth is going to slow faster than consensus expects, or you're going to have to say we're going to have significant upside surprises in inflation. And none of those things seem like they're likely to happen over the next three to six months. Now they will. Some of those things will start to happen in in the first half of next year. But between now and year end, it's very unlikely that any of those three real negative um, catalysts for the market will materialize in that time horizon. Yeah, before I let you go here, because so I know you, we just, we just, we just one more sec, one more sec. Let me say that in a, in a, in a smarter way. The, yeah. the lack of obvious bearish catalyst means that the path of least resistance is higher for, for asset markets. And obviously, if you pull up any long term chart of uh, markets over time, you'll realize that you should generally be long them and not short them. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's always okay to take a little profit too. Okay, Darius, before I let you go, talk to me a little bit about Bitcoin. Uh, give me your outlook. I mean, it's been a volatile market, but anything surprise you? What's your outlook for this year? Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. Uh, so Bitcoin is currently bearish from the respect of our volatility, just momentum signal. And historically, when that condition has been met, Bitcoin tends to go down in price. 
And so that's something that is disconfirming of our general sanguine bias. Uh, we had a great uh, sell in Bitcoin. So we were long Bitcoin from late October uh, through uh, early uh, July of this year. We had a great sell of that. Obviously, Bitcoin had a, a significant drawdown uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we recovered a little bit from there, but it's still down from, from where we sold it. And that is something that is disconfirming our relatively sanguine bias. And so when you think about what pretty much leads to the Bitcoin cycle, it's usually the dynamics in U.S. and global liquidity. And right now, the outlook for global liquidity in terms of our model, we're projecting a slight increase over the medium term. So we're expecting Bitcoin to perhaps recover uh, the, over that time horizon that we uh, projected. Uh, and then with respect to U.S. liquidity, the Treasuries uh, net financing dynamics sort of get or are they're most bearish in here in the third quarter of this year. They will get slightly less uh, negative from the perspective of uh, risk taking in asset markets uh, in the fourth quarter. They're not explicitly positive, but they will get better at the margins in Q4. And so U.S. liquidity dynamics will actually improve in Q4 as well. So you could have a, you know, a, a you know, pretty decent Q4 from the perspective of the U.S. and global liquidity. And if we're right on, on growth in terms of surprising because there's expectations of the upside, it could be pretty, um, I think investors might be uh, very much warranted to uh, having bought the dip here. But the problem is you go back, Jeremy, and you look at our positioning model at the uh, year to date high in the S&P, uh, I want to say on, on, on July 16th, uh, we sent out a note to clients that said our positioning model was flagging about as red as it, as it ever has been. And we said, told them that there was a high risk of a correction over the short to medium term time horizon. And so from the perspective of the positioning cycle, it's rinsed out a little bit, but it's certainly not at a level that will make you feel very comfortable getting as long as you probably were, as long as most investors were at that, in that moment. Yeah, well, the S&P continuing its run today. Darius Dale, the founder and CEO of 42 Macro, joining us from New York to break it all down. Thanks, Darius. I appreciate your time today, and uh, I hope to have you soon, man. Let's, let's do this again. This was fun, Jeremy. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for the invite, and I'll see you again. See you soon. Hey, everyone. I'm Jeremy Safran. For all of us here at Kitco, thanks for watching. We've got some great guests coming up. Be sure to hit that notification button, and we'll see you soon.